first of all, welcome and thanks for attending the Calling from the Cloud event that we're running today. Uh, my name's Cameron Ebury. I'm the General Manager of Sales with JASCO. Um, I hope you haven't taken out a second mortgage today for the parking because uh, it's uh, you, you're paying a premium to get a park over in a lot of the car parks, but don't dis dis uh, despair because we've got a uh, action-packed agenda and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of value out of today's event. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, for those that aren't aware, the toilets uh, are out the back there, so pass reception, and you'll see the ladies and gents just straight ahead. And I think everyone's been able to grab one of the Jesco uh, coffee cups. So if you haven't had a coffee, uh, please make sure you get there either, um, well, probably a bit too late now, but certainly after the event, we're going to be putting on a morning tea. So please make sure that um, you, you grab a coffee and some food and have a chat to, um, to some of our staff who will be floating around in the, uh, in the tablecloth shirts that we're wearing today. Um, I'd just like to give you a quick intro. I can see that we've got a lot of our existing customers here today, uh, but we've also got a lot of new customers that have uh, decided to attend this event. But I just wanted to give you a quick intro as to who JASCO are. So we're an ICT provider that have been in operation since 1998. So we're going to be celebrating our 21st birthday in August this year, which um, we're very pleased about. Um, our, our mission basically is to enable our customers um, to be successful via technology. So when you're dealing with one of our consultants, we really want to get an understanding as to what your business is about so that we can try, try and improve in, um, in four areas, one being innovation, efficiency, productivity, or risk mitigation. As I mentioned to you before, we've got a jam-packed agenda. Um, so I think we might as well kick off proceedings. Um, really pleased that our keynote speaker today is Leon Wright from Microsoft. So I've, I've got to read this one out because I've tried to memorize it, but it's a unique title. But uh, Leon's the advanced workload lead within Micro Microsoft Australia. And he's going to share some um, some of the things that Microsoft are doing around the modern workplace. So uh, if you could come up now, Thanks. Leon, welcome. Thanks, Ken. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, super. There we go. Thanks very much. So how awesome is it to be here today? Winter is here, guys. So we've changed daylight savings and uh, a nice brisk morning in Melbourne. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you know, advanced workload. Basically, I look after the collaboration suite and, and security fits in their portfolio. So those, those are the two components. What I wanted to do today is kind of talk about not really technology, but more about the impact of you know, how people interact with technology. We've got a major shift happening, and this is disruption at work. If anything, this, you know, the way we are doing stuff, the way we envisage stuff, and the way customers and people are engaging with technology is changing. The old hierarchical structures and knowledge is power is being broken down. The new generation works differently. They work collaboratively. Let me give you a real close to home scenario. My son is busy doing a project at the moment at school. His project is about recycling. So what did they do? Did they say to Brandon, Brandon, you need to go and do a recycling project? No, they pulled together a team, a team from across grades and just brought together a whole bunch of people. So you've got different perspectives, different viewpoints. And that's really the way the new generation is thinking. So it's really turning it on its head. It's about collaboration. It's about driving a different outcome together as a team. It's about dynamic networks. You know, do any of us as business people, do you do business on your own in isolation, just with your customer? We're talking about partnering, things like different partners coming together and driving different outcomes, playing on the strengths of not only different people in a company, but different companies coming together to, to, to drive a specific outcome for you as customers. It's about experimenting. And this probably is the biggest thing that is helping Microsoft change. Satya Nadella and Kathleen Hogan, um, you know, our leader and our head of, of HR and people, have got a very simple philosophy. Go out there and try stuff. You, know, you have the mandate. Go, go out there and do 10 things. You're going to get a few wrong. You know, drop two. Don't drop too many balls. But you know, go out there and try things. And I think that is, that is the power of what we're doing. So it's not only the ability. You've got to really empower your sales force and get them out there to be able to do what they do. But it's changing. Do we all know the impact of social media at work? Who, who, who here goes to a meeting without looking up the people you're meeting before the time on LinkedIn? 
you're trying to get as empowered as possible before the occurrence. Most CRM systems already have that built in. that are pulling that social network to empower you as, as salespeople or product people to pull that before you're hitting that engagement. So you're already empowered. That, that really gives you an incredible edge in the market. Devices. Okay, I'm going to do a quick poll. Who's got three devices? Four. Five. Six. Okay, five is the winner at the back there. So I've also got five. If you've got any more than five, I'd say I know a good doctor. It's, um, but, but that's generally what's happening is we are so connected and it's, it's about bringing all those technologies together. And the important part is each of those technologies has to empower you to be fully operational, any one of them. You've got to have the same capabilities on a mobile phone that you have on a fully fledged desktop service. Now, one of the things that I've pulled out over here was this over here. This I've put into the slide, the standard Microsoft slide, I've actually pulled that in. 62% of us when we're connecting to meetings are mobile. That's huge. That's, that's your road warriors out there. And that's why you see the focus that you see from Microsoft in terms of our mobility strategy. Not only protecting that endpoint, but also driving the capabilities of that endpoint. I'm able to, on a Teams meeting, do everything that I can do on my desktop on my mobile phone. I can control the meeting, I can mute, I can present, I can do whatever I can on any other interface. So it's a like-for-like -like interface. It's fully empowered on the, on the uh, back-end network. And then when you take that and you partner it with a partner like Telstra, who's got great coverage going down the 5G track, this is just getting more and more powerful in terms of the abilities that we're now pushing to the edge. You've heard, us, you've heard of Microsoft saying we're pushing compute to the edge. So what you're seeing is that driver. And what you're seeing is you're going to see AI start and already starting to surface in that environment. The, um, it's great having great devices, great technologies. What we aspire to do is to create experiences. We want to create people-centered experiences. It's about creating technology across multiple platforms that are intuitive, that are sexy, people want to use them, and are fully functional. And when we do that, the first criteria that we do is we drive that around you know, people-centered. Accessibility is a major thing for us, ensuring that any person is fully empowered. So, People, have you, who's, who's seen some of the stuff we've been doing on, uh, on uh, accessibility options, like in the ability to, for someone to open up a mobile phone, open up Microsoft applications, and it immediately says, you're looking at a room full of people, okay, standing in a room in front of a whiteboard, so it, it, it explains the environment, or when you're shopping, it's a can of. So it really starts empowering and making technology easy and accessible for all people to, to drive. So this is key for us. Not only that, it's key across platforms, whether you're working from LinkedIn right the way through to our Xbox services, that those, that standard of accessibility is driven through all of those, those products. You can have the greatest stuff. You can have the best products. You can have the best people. The problem is that those people are not engaged, and those people don't love what they do. You will not succeed. It's about driving engagement. Now, Gallup did a survey, and this was, this was pretty scary, where you only have you know, about 15% of people globally are engaged. In the UK, you're looking at about 8%. That goes to the US at 33%. Now, that's a cultural difference. That's a, that's a cultural transformation that needs to take place. Organizations that are truly driving excellence and are outperforming and are driving great share price outcomes on average are over 70% engaged. As leaders, you can take two approaches. You can do an employee engagement survey and you can get a number. Or you can drive an employee engagement strategy and get a result. Two very different approaches. This is probably where we have spent more time as Microsoft driving our digital transformation, our transformation of our workforce has been in this area. Making sure that when you come into work every day, you're doing what you love, you believe in what you do, it not only meets your aspirations if you're a technologist as a te technology person, but also your ethics. 
Who's seen, you know, we've, um, we're pretty open about everything that happens in Microsoft. Who's seen the protests we've had, and not only that, a lot of our competitors also, around AI and how AI is used. That shows values. That shows the values coming through the organization. Not only that, we've really recently, a few days ago, had one on diversity. And that's great. And such a, encourages that. You know, those are the kind of discussions we should be having. Because what that does is that really incubates and drives, you know, inclusive and a real a differential, you know, of, of people and process and brings it in and creates a great outcome for customers. More importantly, you know, if you've got happy people, engaged people, you're driving a much better outcome to your shareholders. On average, 21% more profitable. We aspire to an intelligent workplace for everyone. What does that mean? That means that all devices are designed and created to support the activity and the, the actual outcomes that you need to achieve as you go through your day. It's technology that supports you and doesn't inhibit you in any way or form. It's technology that's built around you and, you, and the way that you physically engage in the workforce or in customers. When we take that and we drive it down to a voice solution, it's not just about voice and it's not just about collaboration. And this is the important part, and, and maybe just spend a little bit more time here. Why, why is the Microsoft voice and collaboration solutions different? Why are we driving it so hard? The, it, it's very simple. As, when it's a bespoke service and it's sitting outside, you can't tap into it, you can't control it, okay, and you can't mine it. And I'll unpack that a little bit further. As soon as you bring it into the fold, in other words, bring it into Office 365, that is immediately a resource you can control, compliance and security. Huge. When I'm engaging with customers out there, and it doesn't matter, right from mid-market SMB, and by the way, in SMB, 43% of all SMB customers are being hacked. It's probably the highest percentage of hacking is happening in SMB customers. So all the way from SMB right the way through large enterprises, this is absolutely crucial to them. It's driving that compliance and security because that's the KPIs that you all carry. So critical getting that right. So that's our first cut is let's get it secure. The next thing is when it's under that environment, and let's, let's make that real. If you want to empower a user, it's a case of creating that user in your existing Office 365 environment, in your existing Active Directory, creating the user for voice. It's no different to your current KPIs. It gives them access to everything they need to have. It's just voice services now as well. It's not sitting bespoke and I'll need a truck roll, that needs a configuration, that needs a ticket. It's sitting over there. It can be done by your normal administrator, by your 365 administrator. It can empower them with voice, conferencing, all the other services. So it's, it's, it's twofold. You can, you can take people and give them a new focus to drive to your bottom line and also brings in, in line all, of, all the other services. When it's sitting inside of 365, that's when we can mine it and we can start driving intelligence over the top of it. And that's where it comes in. And this is the why, is now you can mine it for AI. Now you can start bringing intelligence to bear on a workload that traditionally was sitting bespoke. Things like the ability to do facial recognition inside of a conference, the ability or a meetings type solution, we into real-time transcription. Who's seen the team's capability to do real-time transcriptions of uh, not only transcriptions, but language uh, translations also in real time? Who's seen that capability on teams? That's all AI coming to bear. Now, when you have to bring voice into that workload so that we can start driving those kind of capabilities and, and putting things like transcription services into it. So it's to drive intelligence into the workload. Our vision has got two pillars. You're going to see, firstly, Teams. Everyone knows Teams is at our core. That's what we're driving, and voice is very quickly moving into Teams. And yeah, that'll be the leader, and all the development is starting to be driven into Teams. And then the second pillar of that is AI, is bringing AI to bear on those workloads, driving outcomes. But the absolute, I suppose, the one that really gets me rocking is Microsoft Graph. Who's heard of Graph? Okay, we've got a few. So this is pretty cool. What is Graph? Graph is the biggest map of human activity ever created in the world. I'll say it again, biggest map of human activity ever created. Every single signal that goes through Microsoft services, be it email, voice, browsing, whatever it is, 
is driven through Graph. Graph is essentially an API. It's a REST API for developers out there. It's the ability to physically tap information and track information, not only to track, but also to physically pull and create different applications. And this is what Graph is used for. We do billions of not only authentication, so from a security, let's put a security lens on it quickly. We've got a few billion authentications that happen every day. So by definition, we are seeing when the people are trying to fish, when they're trying to hack, when they're trying to attack, we're seeing that because of the just pure volume that we have. So our ability to take that information, assimilate that, and then remediate um, or, or put in you know, diff different processes to try and counteract it is almost instantaneous because we overlap AI over the top of that. So extremely powerful, just the pure volume information that we're processing. And that's why, you know, if you don't know yet, Microsoft is, is one of the most powerful security vendors out there today. So we are very quickly driving our security strategy. So very, very powerful. And if you don't have Graph, this is, this is really what you should be looking at. At Enterprise Connect, we launched, we have over 500,000 companies now on Microsoft Teams. We launched this product two years ago. So the velocity at which we are driving Teams and the velocity at which we are driving features and capability into Teams is unsurpassed. It's the fastest growing product in Microsoft history. So a real massive focus in terms of driving it. And not only that, the important part of this is the, open, the, the, the openness of Teams. It's not a closed ecosystem. It's totally open. We're bringing all third-party applications. It's fully op open for APIs. Now you can say, oh, Leon, this is my Microsoft. Yes, we rolled out 180,000 of our internal users in four months onto Teams. So, yes, we've got great resources to do this, but it just shows you the capability of what we have in the product. So we are driving this. We are super excited about this. We're super excited how it can help you do your digital transformation. Uh, we're on the journey. Uh, we're, we're learning every single day, uh, you know, and that's going to continue. We're super excited by the, at the direction which Satya is taking us and the latitude which we have. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with Jasco today. Jasco is, is, is truly one of our best partners in terms of going out there and driving the Microsoft messaging and the Microsoft stack. So, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Courtney, really great to be here. I think I'm handing over to Alan now. No, no, no. I'll, I'll oh, sorry. Okay. It's all right. Great. Jump sorry, Cam. Thank you, Apologies, Leon. Mate. Thank you. Really appreciate your insights. I'm now going to call on uh, Courtney Snell. Courtney's our Chief Technical Officer within JASCO. I think he was number four employee within the organisation some 18 years ago. So he's uh, part of the furniture. And Courtney's going to give a um, thorough deep dive regarding the TCO 365 and Microsoft Teams direct routing stack. Uh, and, and he'll elaborate on how that can really benefit your organisation. So over to you, Courtney. Thanks very much, Cameron. You I need that one. A presenter off you. I need to have a shave if I'm becoming part of the furniture. So it's, uh, I didn't realise it was growing that long, mate. So <laughs> apologies for that. Um, so as Cam's indicated, my name's Courtney Snell. Um, I'm the CTO with Inside Jasco Consulting. And within my role at JASCO, I suppose, what my major aim is, is to work uh, with both inside the business and outside the business to make sure that the products and solutions and services that we work on uh, are fit for purpose and meet our customers' requirements. That allows me to work with inside both the sales organisation, um, the technical group, and also the services group in JASCO to make sure that what we uh, deliver, deploy and support uh, makes sense for, for ourselves and all of our customers. And fundamentally, everyone gets, I suppose, the best possible outcome for what we do. So when we look at our journey at JASCO with regards to unified communications, uh, it started well over 10 years ago. Um, and that actually on the back of uh, our managing director and CEO, Jason McClintock, attending a Microsoft partner conference uh, up in uh, Fort Douglas at the point in time. Do you got a place to go to? And I'm sure it was a horrible conference to be at. Um, mind you, he was up there and there was a gentleman from Microsoft who was uh, up the front of the group and he was talking about Office Communications Server 2007. And he was saying that if you weren't communicating as a partner community back to Microsoft using OCS, you know, either instant messages, presence or voice, then you weren't going to get any attention from the Microsoft at that particular point in time. So Jason came back from that conference with an enormous head of, uh, head of steam. And he said, he spoke to me in, a, in, in uh, one of our offices and said, Court, we need to find out what this OCS product is. Very quickly from there, we rolled out OCS internally. We lit it up for voice. And we've been rolling up with iterative upgrades and joining on TAP programs and uh, acceleration programs ever since. Um, and that's really focused through until where we are to today um, in that we've, uh, we've, we've come across and, and we're working in conjunction with both Microsoft and Telstra to be one of the initial seven partners uh, with Inside Australia to be part of the early adopter program for uh, TCO 365. 
which was an enormous achievement for ourselves. Um, and I suppose really uh, demonstrated some of the engagement and the strength of the engagement we've had between both Microsoft and Telstra as well. And this has been a service that we've been, uh, we've been absolutely hanging out for, to bring voice into the cloud, to make it, to get to start to unshackle that, uh, that last vestige of what was a physical uh, cable into, uh, into people's networks. Um, and more recently, um, we've, uh, we were lucky enough to be uh, honoured and awarded the uh, Telstra Microsoft Partner of the Year for 2018 largely on the back of a lot of the work that we did inside of the Telstra Calling for Office 365 stack. Um, and more recently, we've just been announced as the, uh, the best or the number one performing partner um, with inside that particular sales channel as well. So we're doing well. We know what the product is and we understand it because we've had a great deal of time to uncover it and understand and work with inside that space. At an industry level, though, we're coming up to a very interesting, I suppose, uh, inflection point where the cessation of sale of ISDN has already occurred. If you have a look at that graph down the bottom, we're already well and truly halfway through that particular piece. We're seeing that, um, and this date has actually changed from, uh, from June, uh, it's been pushed back in February this year up until uh, September, is that the commencement of active disconnections of ISDN services across Australia. This in itself, ISDN has been a technology that's been known and trusted for many, many years. It's been used widely, um, it's worked very well, but it's certainly had some physicality to it in that you've always had to have an NTU uh, that then delivers the, uh, the connection into wherever the places that you want to deliver those services. Generally speaking, ISDM was based around postcodes or, or, uh, or locations as well. So you couldn't really bring a Sydney-based service into a Melbourne-based location. So there were some challenges around that. But certainly from a, from a technology perspective, it's been well, it's been known, it's trusted, and it's something that's worked very well. It also extends across, as you can see here, it's not just voice services that ISDM was uh, responsible for. There's a number of other data carriage services that are being uh, impacted and affected by this uh, industry-wide catalyst of change. So certainly if you, if you are using ISDN today and you are not um, already well aware of the fact that it's being uh, brought out and, and going into a cessation, the product is being retired, you should absolutely try and ramp that up because very shortly you're going to be either receiving a, a knock on the door or a letter to say those services are going to be actively disconnected. So what does that mean? For us as an industry, well, we can accept the status quo. We can say, not a problem, I've had ISDN, I will simply replace that with SIP. And that is absolutely a valid option. That might mean that you purchase an extra card for your PABX, you put a, uh, a SIP-based card in, uh, you might get a session border controller that acts as a conduit, converting uh, SIP-based signal um, from your telco provider into ISDN so that you've got an internalised in segment so you don't have to upgrade your PABX. Voice in that scenario still stays on premise. And I really resonate back with what Liam was saying before, is that voice has been, I suppose, arguably the last bastion of that workload moving up into the cloud. We've had VoIP there, but certainly the PSTN capability and plumbing that directly into the Office 365 based services is something that we can start to see on scale and start to deliver some real intelligence from the, uh, from the voice workload. So from a Microsoft perspective, we have, I suppose, two options with inside the market space. We've got the Telstra calling for Office 365, which on an international basis um, is also known as PSDN calling. But what's interesting about this particular market offer is that it's the first one uh, with inside Australia that Microsoft is working directly with another carriage provider to deliver the service into the market space. And that's really unique in the Australian market, especially when you consider the position that Telstra has come from with regards to us being that tier one carriage service right across Australia. On the other hand, we have Teams Direct Routing um, as an alternative. So we've got two options front of us, but Maybe it's not just two options. Maybe there's an option where we can get a scenario where both work together, or maybe there's an example uh, in certain scenarios and circumstances where we can lean on both. So Microsoft have done an enormous amount of bringing the communication and collaboration space into what used to be known as the Skype for business. Skype was great for bringing instant messaging, a little bit of uh, voice in, um, bringing in presence, uh, bringing in meetings, trying to join that work experience. But it was very much a siloed communication platform you had to work outside of it in order to deliver, I suppose, the collaboration elements. So any documents that we're working on, we might have been able to share a screen, but fundamentally, um, you know, SharePoint, uh, Exchange, other elements uh, with regards were, were still adjunct or separate to that. And Microsoft Teams allows us to, I suppose, bring all of these in with inside the one interface. It's drawing upon multiple areas with inside the collaboration space, and voice and communication is one aspect that's been directly plumbed in. So when we look at what Telstra has done from an intelligent cloud perspective, they've worked with Microsoft on that collaboration space. They've been able to provide the best of both worlds by removing the infrastructure requirements that have bound us before with having either physical session border controllers or physical PABXs on premise, and they've virtualized those services as a SIP-based carriage 
directly plumbed into the Microsoft Office 365 services in the cloud. It gives a really nice, easy uh, runway with regards to purchasing and transactions. It's a license-based SKU that you work with in conjunction with Microsoft Office 365. You have the Telstra calling plans. Um, and certainly, it provides a great unified experience with regards to scaling up and scaling down as required. So fundamentally, how is it different? Now, if we look at the, the two diagrams that I have up here on screen, um, and I suppose I don't want to get too in-depth as to what the, uh, the individual working parts are and how they, how they work with each other. But on the right-hand side, we have a typical Skype for business environment. You might have had two standard edition pools, two standard edition servers acting as a highly available pair between them so that one could go down, the other one would then start to balance the load. Uh, you've got the PSTN gateway at the top, which is how we connect to the, uh, to the telephony carriage. Uh, down the bottom, we've got the Exchange Unified Messaging Server that provides the voicemail services um, so that the voicemails are getting delivered directly in your inbox. We've got the Office Web Server, App Server, if, in case you're presenting PowerPoint presentations. We've got a HTTP proxy reverse or reverse proxy service and also an Edge Server to provide that remote access and also federated capabilities. You can appreciate why um, there was only a select few amount of partners inside Australia who are voice certified. The complexity and the bar barrier of entry in order to deliver and successfully maintain the support and infrastructure like that was absolutely sky high. And so there's an only a, a certain amount of people who, um, you know, I suppose, were qualified and were, were given that gold certification from Microsoft. On the left-hand side was a, uh, an approach by Microsoft known as uh, the Cloud Connector Edition, which was uh, ideally a way of trying to containerize all of those individual server roles into one AU. So leaning on vendors such as Sonos or Ribbon and Audio Codes to provide a piece of equipment that had a session border controller with a number of virtual machines all put in a one U or two U chassis to try and augment or hide out the fact that all this magic was happening underneath. And that was then directly connected across to Office 365. As you can see there, they're trying an approach to make it simple, but there's still a lot of moving parts and there's still a lot of resilience upon individual elements within inside that stack. So what's different and how do we move forward? Telstra calling for Office 365 completely removes that any of that on-premise server infrastructure from a Skype for business uh, perspective or a uh, cloud connector um, uh, infrastructure. The PSTN services are directly plumbed in from Telstra to the Office 365 based data centers. As a user object, what you need to manage is the client. You get the choice. Am I using the traditional Skype client, which may be a vestige of where you've come from, or will you start to look at where Teams comes into play and how voice can start to play a direct impact on your, uh, your collaboration workspace? You get the option with Telstra calling for Office 365 as to which client you use. It also, because Skype for Business allows you the ability to join environments together as a hybrid, if you have an on-premise scenario, you can hybrid enable that migrate your users up as you would move an exchange mailbox from one platform to another. And you can then move your, tele your telephone numbers through a standard porting process across into the Telstra Calling for Office 365 platform. Thus, moving your users with the same experience and enabling them to use Skype or Teams uh, up in a cloud-based service. Thus, allowing you to then decommission those on-prem based SIP services or potentially ISDN services uh, that you may already be using. The investment and the engineering that's been put or brought to bear from both Microsoft and Telstra has been enormous. As you can imagine, there's multiple uh, geographic regions within inside Australia from an Office 365 space. Telstra and Microsoft, have, as I said before, have spent a large time making sure that architecture is as robust as possible. It's not just one data center, multiple data centers. It's not just one lead in, but multiple links in. And all of those circuits are capacity managed to make sure that they've got the best possible uh, speed, performance, and lowest latency to deliver those voice carriage services directly into uh, Microsoft Teams or Skype for Business Online. Teams direct routing, on the other hand, is looks a little bit like Cloud Connector Edition, but I want to cut the distinction there. It completely removes all of the virtualization endpoints. It is purely a certified session border controller that has the smarts and capability to be able to register up to Office 365. Certainly from a carriage purpose, you can bring in a carriage service from any of your chosen providers. Uh, obviously Telstra, uh, SIP Connect is a service that works very well in this particular scenario. And you can deliver those services as you like to, manage those, manage those services. What it means is that fundamentally, your route to the internet has never been more important from a telephony perspective. If your session border controller goes down, if your internet service goes down, um, then in essence, you have just cut the telephone uh, off from the organization at that particular point in time. So certainly planning and understanding where the breakpoints are or where resilience needs to be brought into bear 
is an important aspect with regards to driving this particular solution. What's interesting to note about this particular option with Teams Direct Routing, though, is that you are required to use the Teams client. In the previous slide, you would have seen with Telstra calling for Office 365, you had the choice. Migrate into Skype for Business and start using both clients. But from a Teams Direct Routing option, you need to be using that Teams client in order to deliver those voice services back out. You might read in some of the forums of people who've been able to hack ways to get Skype for Business to work um, through the Teams Direct Routing. Yes, you can hack it. Is it supported? No. If you run into issues, you're on your own at that particular point in time. So it's really important to understand that from a directionality and a strategy point of view, with a Teams Direct Routing option, you really are pushing forward with a, uh, with a Teams-based voice strategy and overall collaboration platform moving forward. Initially, I suppose it was a great option for, in, for countries where PSTN calling wasn't natively available. You could deploy this session border controller on premise. Um, and it also allows customers who might have maybe long-term telco contracts to start to engage and bring their users into the Office 365 platform without having to wear a lot of uh, early termination fees um, from ripping up those, uh, those traditional on-premise services. Um, it also allows us to provide some, I suppose, flexibility with regards to how we migrate users, even at a SIP-based level. You might be working from one uh, non-compatible PABX, but if you can route the, route, the, uh, route the SIP or the ISDN services back through the session border controller internally, then uh, you've got some options with regards to migrating of users. There is another area where Teams Direct Routing provides a distinct advantage uh, over and above uh, the Telstra calling for Office 365. And that is, if we look at this with a session border controller in the middle of this particular diagram, that is a piece of hardware that fundamentally sits either as a virtual or physical piece inside your network um, or someone, somewhere that is, uh, that is available to you. Because the session border controller has a network-based routing, um, you're able to connect in potentially either a, uh, an analog uh, ATA-based service. Maybe you've got a building uh, lift or maybe you've got some, some copper wires inside the building that you can't replace the infrastructure. Or maybe you've got a PA system uh, in the roof that is a SIP-based PA system that might not be able to be called directly from the uh, directly from the PSTN network. By virtue of you having a session border controller on-prem that has a relationship to Office 365, you can route the call down from your users to your on-premise PSTN endpoints that may or may not be Skype enabled or Teams enabled in that scenario. And this is where I said before, we have Telstra calling for Office 365 and we have Teams direct routing, but the two are not mutually exclusive. You can absolutely use both of them together to provide the best possible outcome in order to route calls to the most appropriate location. In the diagram that we see here up top, we've got a user who is uh, lit up for Telstra calling for Office 365. And if they're making a plus six one call with Inside Australia, that's routing out through Office 365, coming back into the PSTN network. Not a problem. Standard Telstra calling for Office 365 call route. However, we have a Teams Direct route option that's configured in our Office 365 cloud that says if I'm calling maybe plus four four, maybe I'm calling across to, uh, to the UK, for example, or some sort of analog device or third party PABX, Call route grabs it and it brings it down through the session border controller, which gives us the ability to manipulate the call route to send it in another direction should we need to. So it provides the best of both worlds in that you can have the advantage of having a simplicity for all of your users using Telstra calling for Office 365. But for those advanced requirements where you need a special routing, uh, special routing location, or you might have some other agreements or some other PABX based relationship, you can still bring those particular call leads down on prem to facilitate and manipulate them as you need to. So when we look at a high level across the voice options that are available in the stack, Office 365 at the top, and you've got Microsoft Teams and Skype, uh, Skype for Business Online. The phone system license is ubiquitous across both those licenses. You need that phone system license that provides you with the, uh, I suppose, the PABX functionality. But when we look at Telstra Calling, Telstra Calling gives us the ability to choose which client am I going to use. However, if we're using a direct routing for Teams with a telco trunk, with a telco trunk service, we're then locked into that the, the, uh, the Microsoft Teams uh, based platform moving forward in order to provide those or deliver those services. Certainly not preventing you from using Skype Online and Office 365. All I'm saying is that that PST and calling element of Skype Online will not be able to be used in the Teams direct routing scenario. So let's jump in and try and perform some demonstrations. So at JASCO, I suppose it's, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, an indication as to how we run. Um, we are a little bit of a Frankenstein. Um, we have Telstra calling for Office 365. We have an on-prem Skype for Business 2015-2019 uh, environment, uh, and we also have Teams Direct Routing. So if anyone wants to know if they all work together, 
Yes, they do. Um, would I recommend it? Probably not. Um, but the, what it gives us is the great ability to see lots of different customer circumstances and environments and we can start to workshop and understand what are the different nuances of the different technologies working together. So for example, myself uh, at, at Courtney Snell, I'm a, a, a TCO365 native user. Uh, Mike Rogers, who's in the room, Mike, you want to stick your mics at the front here? Mike is a direct, uh, Teams direct routing uh, user. Uh, Alan, um, who is uh, across at the back of the room, is a uh, Skype for Business on-premise user. Now we route those calls you know, based upon the best possible location, but we're doing this so that we can test all of those individual scenarios. So what I'm going to demonstrate today uh, is the most fundamental of tests to start with. Can I make an outbound telephone call? <laughs> so you're going to see here I'm presenting, so Skype's already gone into the fact that it knows I'm presenting, so it's put me into Do Not Disturb. So I'll just turn that one back to uh, available. And uh, at a telephone, I'm just going to dial my, uh, my mobile number for start. Oops. Voila, we have a call coming through on my phone, which I'll choose to decline that one. That's a uh, quick to bring that one down, but that was a Movember photo that was. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm saving up this year as well. So we'll uh, we'll have another one of those funny photos coming shortly. That's me dialing out from the uh, from the Skype for Business collab. Nothing really too exciting about that. It's not sexy. It's just I'm making a telephone call. Absolutely. But as I said before, I get the ability to choose what is the client that I'm actually going to use. So I've got in my scenario both clients open. So in this scenario, I'm going to go across into calls. Uh, and I'm going to have a look for Alan in the list. There's uh, Alan Smith. There we go. I'm going to click on Al. And Al at the back of the room should be receiving a call on his mobile phone any minute. There we go. Fantastic. Once again, not very exciting. It's a telephone call. I hope it works. We're talking about voices of workload here. We, we're all well and truly above this particular. But you need to understand that at that one telephone number that I've got, assigning that license to me, it works regardless of what client I choose to use. However, what's fundamental to this though, is that if I am using both clients, Office 365 will only route that call inbound to one particular location. And as an administrator, I get to choose what is that inbound location as part of the voice routing policy. In my scenario at the moment, I'm still on Skype for Business. So when the call comes through for myself, I've got that toast coming up in the bottom right hand corner as a Skype for Business toast. If I change that policy across to be Microsoft Teams, Teams would start calling for me. So I've got that flexibility if you are migrating users from an on-premise Skype for Business or a legacy Skype for Business platform or even Link, um, you can bring users in wash out and absorb that, that, I suppose, that migration that give users the flexibility to continue to use the old client whilst you look at how you can potentially adopt a Microsoft Teams-based solution with giving users the flexibility of how they place those outbound calls. You now, it gives people a lot of comfort with regards to testing something, knowing that they can still go back to the old, uh, the old platform. I've seen a number of migrations before with PABX migrations where people ma will maintain two phones on their desk just so that in the event something goes wrong, they've still got the comfort of being able to do what they used to be able to do because they weren't trained or didn't understand properly the new platform. This gives you the flexibility to be able to migrate in, still give users that flexibility, but also gives you choice of, uh, of, of outcome as to where those, those calls are, are positioned and destined at the end. From a license allocation perspective, just jump in here to... Multi-factor authentication from Microsoft. So whenever I log into any of my Office 365 based services, I'm always being prompted uh, if I'm outside the office to extra validate who I am. My username and password's great, but if I'm not within inside the corporate network from a domain join machine, it doesn't trust me. It allows me to, or it prompts me for that extra level of confirmation, which is what I just did there with, uh, with that telephone call coming through. 
So if I have a look at the office, the Microsoft uh, 365 Admin Center, and I search for my particular user account, So ask me to re-authenticate. Oh, thank you, it doesn't. Okay, caught the smell. We have a look at the product licenses that I have assigned to myself. And this leads towards what is the actual uh, requirement a little later on. I've got my Office 365 Enterprise E5 uh, without audio conferencing. And with inside here, you'll notice I've got Microsoft Teams uh, enabled. And I also have Skype for Business uh, plan, uh, Online Plan 2. And you'll also notice that the Telstra calling for Office 365 license is directly embedded with inside uh, the Office 365 licensing portal. And that's, I suppose, a really important aspect to note is that the collaboration between Microsoft and Telstra has uh, provided the ability to, I suppose, provide that native experience with regards to license assignment inside the portal. It's absolutely fantastic. If I'm having a look at uh, the, with regards to user allocation or how, how I'm assigning numbers, you notice in this particular list there are two different types of numbers. There's a service number and there's user numbers. Inside Jasco, we have a 100 number block that we've purchased from Telstra. Um, the service numbers are used for auto attendants and IVRs, um, so the, the automated auto attendants that answer automatically and then distribute the calls across. A number that's allocated to users uh, can be assigned across uh, to an individual person uh, as simply as just clicking the assign button and searching um, the appropriate user um, with inside the list. So very straightforward to manage or to assign those licenses. Obviously the ability also is there in order to, to generate that and provide that through a, a PowerShell based command as well. From a Teams uh, direct routing perspective, um, it is very much PowerShell driven at the moment. So allocating or assigning those, in, those telephone numbers across to end users is not driven through the interface at the moment. So that's something just to be aware of. Um, from that perspective. But I'm going to now join into a meeting that, uh, that we set up uh, between uh, Jahan, um, Alan at the back, and also we have over here on the right hand side a, a piece of equipment from the guys at Poly. We have a, a new studio uh, room based endpoint um, that's also been included across with the HP Slice, um, which has a, a meeting that we've scheduled across. So I'm going to jump into that meeting and we're going to show, go through some of the, the, the co authoring and the, um, uh, and the collaboration elements that are within inside this piece. So as you see down the bottom, Alan Smith's actually started that particular meeting. It gives me the prompt. I'm going to join that particular uh, meeting. And I'm going to choose that maybe at the moment I'm a little bit unsure about the background that I've got here. Um, I, I might be at home. Uh, you know, there might be some, something that I don't want people to see behind me. So I'm going to turn blur on um, to try and obscure the background location. And I'm going to join now. What you'll also notice is up in the top right hand corner, we've got someone who's connecting from outside the organisation. You'll see it says Melbourne Teams Room is waiting in the lobby. Now this is an account that has been, that's come through from the Polycom, uh, Polycom Teams tenancy. It's not part of Jasco, but it's someone I invited into the meeting. And because they're external to the organisation, I get the ability to uh, view the lobby. Um, and if I want to, I can either admit or, uh, or reject that particular response. So I'm going to allow those guys to come in at this particular point in time. So they're in. Neric is just uh, locking down the voice so that we're not getting enormous amounts of feedback coming through. But this is the simplicity of being able to draw people into a, to an online meeting. One of the elements that I suppose I want to show now is, uh, is how we can start to share information and co-collaborate uh, between uh, different elements. So currently, Alan is on his, uh, his Android mobile phone. Um, Al, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to break out of uh, this. I'm going to start to share my, my screen so that everyone can see what we're doing. I'm going to share this particular desktop. I'm going to share the team itself. And I'm going to go into a chat location that Alan and I have. And uh, going through some of the elements. So at the, up here, we can see conversations that Alan and I have had previously, uh, files that we've shared between ourselves, um, some organizational hierarchy with inside uh, where Alan sits with inside the organization. Um, but I've also uploaded a PowerPoint presentation um, and also a, a Jasco document uh, that we quite often collaborate or, or worked on together. So I've directly added this into, I suppose, our communication channel, for want of a better term. 
So this is a document that we have here that allows uh, that we can we can review directly in line from Microsoft Teams. But also I can then go in and I can edit that directly with inside Word. So the people at the moment outside the organization can see what I'm doing because I'm sharing my screen. Alan, on the other hand, is inside my organization. So he has the ability to work directly with inside this document as part of an Office 365 co-authoring experience through the Microsoft Office backend services that is provided by Word, Excel, and also uh, PowerPoint, um, provided by SharePoint. Here we go, we've got Sam from Macca's trial, so it's exciting news. You know, when you open that, so <laughs> let that one go. <laughs> Trust me, I don't watch it. So <laughs> the final wasn't on last night, I promise. So it's <laughs> um, so from within inside here, I'm opening. I'm editing this particular document. Um, Al, if you're jumping in from the back at the moment, I just love, I suppose, to to showcase. Uh, we can see here that Alan's actually not in the document because the Word document itself doesn't provide me with that, that indication that he's up there at the moment. But in essence, what I'm looking for is to do some some uh, some co-authoring, is some editing across here with Alan at the moment. Um, Al, if are you jumping in from your laptop at the moment? Yep, you are. That's all right. I'm going to put you under the, the pressure here, mate. So you're under the pump. Let me know when you're in. We do have the ability to, with inside uh, a, a team or a group, we can invite guests to have a more meaningful impact. As you've seen here, I've already invited in a remote participant. At the moment, they're just into the, the meeting or the conference. They're looking at the, the presentation that we're developing. But I can also invite uh, those individual external uh, guests into be an active participant with inside my team. What that means is I can start to upload files, we can start to edit files, um, and in essence, they, are, they have guest access with inside my Microsoft Teams or my Office 365 tenancy. Um, Certainly, some you know, so there needs to be some some planning and some governance done around making sure that you're not exposing and opening up corporate data to uh, to the to the world wide web. You want to make sure the people you're sharing that data with is is most appropriate. But uh, it allows the ability, and this is something that Leon said before, that business to business based communication that once used to be just either done through desktop sharing and and allowing people to remote control your location. You've now got the ability to invite people directly with the inside documents that you're working on and co collaborate. Uh, across businesses or inside the business, regardless of where the user is located, as long as they have an internet-based service. Looks like Els, uh, I'm not doing anything, so he's obviously been up there and highlighting some certain sections with them inside the document. So this just provides the ability, as we can see, Al and I are both co-collaborating co on this document. We've got someone in here at the moment who's actually viewing what we're doing. So we're able to provide that, that, that sharing-based um, sharing analogy. What I'll do is I'll jump out of that particular call, Al, if that's all right. I'll, uh, I'll close down uh, this particular location. And what I will show you is uh, an event that we recorded uh, a little while ago. So in preparation for this particular event, I was doing a dry run uh, on, uh, on Friday last week, and I recorded it. And I can see that it's actually brought it straight with inside the, uh, the, Teams, uh, the Teams channel. This is now leveraging another one of the back-end services provided um, from Microsoft Office 365 using Stream. Um, the great part about this is that we've also got the ability to turn closed captioning uh, on, so we can start to see the words that are actually being uh, words are actually being spoken as we play the video. So there's a transcription service that occurs in the back end here, and if I launch out and across jump into Microsoft Stream itself, sign back in on this particular instance, jump into Stream. Go across to my content. See that same video that I was just looking at there, the dry run for the event. And if we have a look up in the right hand side, um, we'll see that transcription. And I can search through here um, for specific words. So let's just do a search for ISDN. It'll take me straight through to where I said that ISDN word inside the particular uh, meeting. So as the, as the meeting has been recorded, it's been uploaded into Microsoft Stream, it's that, that artificial intelligence that we heard Leon talking about before. We're using the voice intelligently and transcribing it, going over, trying to articulate what was actually said, and then providing that as meaningful content back up into uh, the collaboration platform. If you go through here and you find words that, you know, maybe that's not exactly what I said, um, we do have the ability to, uh, to edit these, these types of services too. So we can go through in retrospectively and start to edit the transcript should we need to, um, which is, uh, you know, it, it just gives us the, as we see here, so 
maybe I didn't say uh, the word given, so you go in there and you can start to make those changes across. As I said before, we've got the closed captioning section turned on there. So the voice element that's always been real time, it's always been between you and me and the other people inside that call, is now a digital asset that is uploaded with inside the cloud space. We can convert it, we can, we can strip it down, we can analyze it, we can look at it, and we've got that information um, for as long as we would like to retain it for. So it's really taking what is that, that real time uh, content and bringing it into something that is now much more consumable as a digital asset with inside the business. Shaham, would you like to come up uh, for a second, just have a, uh, a quick chat about the, uh, the team's client? All right. Thanks, Court. No worries. Look, I think um, Court and Leon did a great job at talking about teams, and you just showed pretty much everything here. But I'll reiterate a few few things, right? And I think the um, general consensus is, is that Skype for Business wasn't sexy. I heard that a couple of times. <laughs> I didn't know software could be sexy, first of all. But um, yes, Teams has got that excitement in it, right? However, I will point out at the same time, it can be a little bit overwhelming, right? For a lot of people. So Skype for Business is quite easy, simple to understand, simple to use. You know where the call button is. You know where the meeting join button is. You kind of do that, get out go about your day, but that's was very limited. So you can't do much with that. However, when we introduce Teams, if you look at it, it just looks like a wall of text. So if you introduce Teams as, you know, if you're in IT, you say, let's roll out Teams, and, and um, chances are your, your end users will probably look at it once, twice, and close it up and say, I don't need another, I don't need another program to do what I'm already used to doing. I, I know where my phone is, it's on my desk, I'll pick it up, make a call, put it back down. Why do I need this? So really, you have to have a use case, a good scenario with this rollout for Teams. Your end users have to understand why it is being rolled out and how it can make them more efficient and more agile on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll quickly just go over um, you know what the what the client looks like and and really what sort of um, magic you can do with it and some of the great features like transcript and searching through the transcript that Courtney has just shown. Um, so if you look here on the top left, we've got a panel here which shows you your activity. So personally, I'll I'll kind of relate it back to again and everyone uses Teams differently. So personally, the way I use it is that I've now noticed that I use email a lot less because, you know, and, and going back to Leon's point, pretty much everyone at this point is using Teams within Microsoft. So we rely heavily on Teams on a day-to-day -day basis. What that means is if I, if someone was gonna send me an email, they're now mentioning me within Teams. When they mention me, they can add my name, kind of like Twitter and whatever other social medias are out there now. Um, and it will show up on my activity feed here. So I know exactly you know, when someone is trying to get a hold of me or they're trying to get my attention, I can look at it that way. The powerful features of chat, right? Um, you know, the co-authoring, great. But going back to that point of using email a lot less. So in the past, I was searching through files. I'd look for, you know, I, I can't recall when someone sent me a file or where, where it is in my email. However, with this, I can go right in my chat, click on file, and all the files that I've shared with this person specifically will always be there, will always be saved there. And I can hop into that file, and at any time, I can start co-authoring. So um, Teams, of course, it's called Microsoft Teams, so there's a big, big focus on Teams. Essentially, you can have many, many different teams, so I can see Court's got you know, senior leadership team, I won't touch that because there's probably a, a lot of things in there that you don't want others to see. But if you look at the projects team here, so they've created one team called projects team, and they've got a lot of subheadings underneath that. What are those? They're called channels. So within that one team, let's say you're working on 
you know, um, the different customers, for example, and you want to have a different channel for each one of them, you're able to have that and separate it that way as well. So it's quite powerful um, when you look at it in that sense. So the other one that we've got with them, it's called Jasco and Microsoft Partner Engagement. So what Jasco have done is invited some of the Microsoft folks as guests into their own environment. We can do that with anyone. So if you've got you know, other customers or partners that you wanted to bring in, you can do that quite easily and collaborate that way. So over here, if I go in, um, so one really powerful thing that I wanna show you is the tabs at the top. I kind of touched on that a little bit. However, we've also got in our team, in my uh, personal teams, I've got you know, a architect team, which I'm a part of. So every week we've got weekly meetings. My manager goes in and he's added a, essentially a tab for OneNote because we use that quite a bit. So Monday mornings we have our meeting. He'll go in on Sunday night, up the, update the OneNote, we're able to go in, have a look at what actionable items there are, able to comment on it as a whole team, and it'll all get updated there so that we're prepared for our Monday morning meeting. It's quite powerful. And of course, you've got meetings here. Um, you're able to see what meetings are scheduled. This is pu pulling a lot of this directly from your Outlook. So you're, if you wanted to schedule a Teams meeting this way, you are able to just hop into the meeting section and schedule one that way. Or of course you can go into your Outlook client and schedule it there as well. Calls, Courtney's pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, we've, we've kind of touched on that uh, as well. And we've got a big repository of all the files that you've shared with everyone if you wanted to view it that way. Or again, you can go into the specific chats or teams and you can see whatever files were shared between them. Now, the big thing here that I wanna point out is, is the extensibility and the third party apps and tabs and bots that you're able to bring in. And not only that, but you're able to create them yourselves if you see a use case for that. So the IT folks in your companies can really be the champions and start thinking outside the box of how they can utilize some of the APIs that we have available to create something that will really make the rest of the organization a lot more efficient, right? And we've got, you know, a few of um, the tabs that you can see here, you know, Cisco WebEx tab, we've got um, Trello, Evernote, Zoom meeting. So we've got, you know, a lot of extensibility and it's quite open. And so, um, you know, very, very powerful again, but, if you want to have a great experience with this, you have to have a great rollout and you have to have a great strategy for adoption because at the end of the day, you can roll this out, but if your users are not utilizing this to its full potential, there really is no reason for it. So really urge you guys, if you are thinking about your team's journey, to reach out to some of the folks at Jasco so they can help you with a lot of that. They can help you with the governance. That's, that's, um, that's pretty much it, yeah. No worries. And I think I'm, I'm handing it back to you. That's it. That's it. Right? Talking about myself, man. So <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Johan. Thanks for taking us uh, through that element. I'll uh, I'll just close out of that particular document and thanks, Al, for uh, for joining in and and uh, helping us with the demonstration as well. So I will push back into presentation. So as Leon mentioned before, and this is something that came out of uh, Enterprise Connect, Microsoft Teams is uh, you know, celebrating two years of, of accelerated growth and has now been named with Inside Microsoft as the fastest growing business application um, that's ever, ever, been, uh, ever been released with Inside of Microsoft. Some staggering statistics with regards to both the uptake, but also um, the scalability in some of the larger organizations that have been deployed out across, uh, across the worldwide landscape. So if you've got any queries with regards to how scalable is this as a cloud solution, um, you need to look no further than that bottom right-hand quadrant that talks about, you know, over 150 organisations have over 10,000 people uh, actively using it. Jahan touched on this before, and I really wanted to reiterate that point. 
is that Teams isn't necessarily the same for every user who, who, who uses it day to day. I know that my use case is completely separate from the way the sales guys use it, completely separate from the way the admin team with inside Jasco use it. Um, I use it completely individually. If you look across the left hand side of this particular uh, diagram, we can see that what would typically be looked at is that the sales guys or the road warriors are probably very heavily entrenched across in that unified communication stack. They're always talking to people, they're talking to customers, they're attending meetings, they're visiting, they're on the road, they're driving that one-to-one that -one or one-to-many based communication. They're not spending nearly as much time um, necessarily, I suppose, you know, working inside maybe dashboards from Power BI or, or uh, hopefully they're not spending a great deal of time on Facebook. Um, but, uh, and hopefully from, a, uh, from an extensibility and API perspective, they, you know, development isn't um, and extending into those other application streams might not be fundamental to the way in which they operate their job. Conversely, if you look at myself from an operations perspective, who's working both inside the business and outside the business, um, I do consume both, I suppose, a relatively large amount of uh, the unified communication. But I'm also consuming a lot of elements directly with inside teams with regards to collaboration content, um, bringing people in from different sources, communicating with Microsoft, communicating with Polycom, bringing them into these meetings so that we can coordinate and collaborate business to business and also uh, business to customer as well. So I've got, I suppose, a different use case in which I use it. And also, if we then go across the right-hand side of that particular diagram, you can see that a developer might be bringing in elements from GitHub. They might be bringing in elements from, from Evernote or from Trello or from, from other platforms in the way that they augment uh, their day-to-day -day activities inside and outside of Microsoft Teams. So the platform itself doesn't need to be the same as everyone. Skype certainly gave you the same platform, the same look feel, regardless of who you were. But Teams gives you the ability to create author and also manipulate the way in which you engage and use the platform moving forward. It's really fundamental to say that Microsoft a number of years ago understood and when we looked at the complexity of the Skype for Business building blocks before how many people could get it wrong. So Microsoft created a prescribed approach called the Skype for Business Operations Framework that allowed businesses to understand what is the journey and the planning and the readiness process that I need to go through as an organisation to drive the best and most successful outcome. That's more recently involved into what's been uh, called the, uh, the practical guidance for cloud voice. And it's something that Jasco adheres to whenever we approach any new customers. And certainly with regards to a Telstra calling for Office 365 and Teams Direct routing engagement, voice being that, that critical workload that we're working on, we need to understand uh, that it's not a one size fits all approach. You need to tailor it based upon where you're starting. So understanding that current state and understanding what that desired state outcome looks like so that we can make sure the transition is as smooth as possible to deliver the best possible outcome. And planning is really fundamental to that aspect. And that's why we have the readiness and planning assessment document that goes hand in hand with, with our engagements to try and provide an outcome of not just what the, uh, what the output documents and the migration plans are and what the end user adoption and change management looks like, but also have we made sure that the, the, the network um, is actually capable of delivering like a pure cloud-based service? Because it stands to reason that the network has never been more important or that connectivity across the internet when we start moving services outside the organisation, you certainly don't want to start to create bottlenecks for your users and start to create a poor, a poor experience moving forward. Certainly the effort you put in to that, that planning and readiness assessment um, certainly drives dividends on the, on the reverse side of that as well. When we look at the Telstra calling for Office 365, there are three main calling plans that are available uh, to, to the users moving forward. The premium call includes all local, national and mobile calls for $18 uh, per user per month. Um, cost. It doesn't include international uh, numbers with inside, but that's charged at the standard Telstra flag four rates for international calls. There's then the essentials that includes the local and national, but no mobile, and also the standard calls that includes basically just the ability for you to make telephone calls through the service, but all calls are charged at the standard rate. This is also used for large businesses that may have already pre-negotiated some special call rates that uh, might provide some advantages. So part of the, uh, the, the readiness and planning assessment that we go through is we understand do customers already have a BSA or a CSA where they have an agreed call rate schedule? And would it be more appropriate to license this using the standard call plan because they might be getting a fantastic call rate as, a, as opposed to the essentials or the premium based call plan? And as you can see, and as I articulated before in the demonstration, the ability to turn that license on for the user has been directly integrated with inside the Office 365 admin portal. So it's very straightforward to light that up once the licenses are available. So if we break down the options from Telstra calling for Office 365, we need the calling plan on the left-hand side. We also need an Office 365 base license that gives us the Teams or the Skype for Business client. If we use E5, that's included with that. It also includes the phone system. If we're E3, 
we need to add the phone system license. If we're E1, we add the phone system as well. And also for those lower SKUs, we have the option to add in the audio conference as well. Audio conferencing is the ability for you to schedule a meeting that has a telephone dial-in number that people who might not be Teams or Skype enabled to come in on a standard PSTN line. You can pick up the home phone, dial that telephone, and join in for the audio component. Take it on the road as an audio component for those users who don't have the ability to jump in with it to a, uh, a, a, a smartphone or a, uh, a PC-based endpoint to join in. Conversely, when we look at Teams, direct routing, we obviously don't need that Telstra calling plan on the left-hand side. But what we do need that is an additional cost outside of the Microsoft 365 based licensing is we need to procure a session border controller. That's a piece of hardware for a virtual appliance that needs to be added. We also need to have a contract with a telco to provide that SIP based service delivered into that session border controller. We need a public certificate um, for the SBC because there is a trusted relationship between the internet side of that SBC and the Office 365 based services. And we also need a public IP address uh, to start exposing that service out to the Office 365 based services. So they're the two distinct paths that when you're looking at from uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the licensing or what are the moving parts with regards to turning the services on. From, an office, or from a Telstra calling for Office 365, there is, I suppose it's important to understand that from a business rule perspective, it's currently only available to Australian-based tenants only. And what I mean by that is that your Office 365 tenant is based with inside the, uh, the Australian geography. There is some work at the moment to try and, I suppose, open that up or change that. Certainly watch this space, but there's you know, certainly no announcement today as to what that might look like or what the time frame is on that front. We can, at the moment, only bring in Australian telephone numbers into Telstra calling for Office 365. We can't bring in a Singapore number or a UK number or and have that directly registered with inside the tent. It's just not possible. Obviously, Telstra only have the ability, in this particular scenario, to sell Australian-based telephony. We can't mix and match calling plans. We can't have 20 users on the standard plan and, and 100 users on the $18 plan. You need to make that, that choice up front. You can change later on down the track. You're not locked in to just the 18 for time evermore. You can make a, a, a full switch later on if you find that there's a better option coming up. That's something that you do have the ability to change uh, retrospects post, uh, post lighting it up. Um, currently available to Telstra Enterprise and also uh, premium and business customers only. There is a trial in place at the moment for uh, SMB customers. Uh, but by and large, you need to make sure that you are a Telstra managed customer in order to be eligible to turn the services on. Fundamentally around making sure that you have the billing mechanism available in order to, uh, to, to uh, turn the services on. Telstra also need to be added as your CSP in order to deliver those licenses into your tenant. As you saw before with the slider with the Telstra calling for Office 365, that doesn't happen by magic. Telstra need to have the ability to get into your tenant to be able to insert and inject those licenses through. So adding them as the CSP is required. And also the base license that we saw before with either the E5, the E3 or the E1 needs to be procured through the Telstra CSP plan. So if you're currently purchasing those through, a, uh, through a, another vendor, whether it might be a RIPE or an Ingram Micro or a Cynix, those licenses will need to be transferred across into the Telstra CSP in order to be attached to the Telstra calling. And also we can incorporate um, PSTN numbers internationally if the custom has an EA. I know this is something that's actually been quite challenging uh, for us at the moment with, uh, with AMC who will uh, talk about later. I'm not sure whether you want to talk about that particular aspect. But fundamentally, it's possible. We're having some challenges with regards to a licensing organisation at the moment in being able to transact those licences out of Australia. But at a technical level, absolutely, we can bring in PST and calling services from other regions and have them housed inside the uh, a, a, a single tenancy across the globe. What to be aware of? Obviously, the contact centre space is, is an area that's still evolving as a, as a pure cloud voice play. However, there are a number of vendors who are in the, in the space at the moment. And the one of note that I would call out across both Teams Direct Routing and also Telstra Calling for Office 365 are the, uh, the Genesis pure cloud space um, that has a, a great level of integration uh, between both uh, native Skype and also native Teams. If you're looking at Telstra Calling for Office 365, that advanced manipulation of the SIP headers and packets is not there. That's something that has to be done at the session border control level. So that is something that you would look at from a Teams Direct Routing. If you're doing manipulation of, of you know, presentation of, of the SIP packets, you do need to bring that back down on-prem. On Telstra Calling for Office 365 guarantees you the capacity for all of the users that you license to be able to make a, a, an outbound call. So if you've got 200 users licensed, you can make 200 telephone calls. Conversely, from a Teams Direct Routing option, you are, you are capacity managed by the size of your SIP trunk. So it's back to the days of ISDN and SIP where you need to purchase the appropriately sized trunk in order to deliver concurrent call capability. That's not a limitation with Telstra calling for Office 365. And I suppose a really fundamental difference is that you're guaranteed to be able to give every user inside the organisation a telephone call at the same time. 
Um, that's capacity managed from Telstra's backend platform. You get the ability to choose your client Telstra, from Telstra calling for Office 365. If you want to start in Skype and migrate across to Teams, you've got that ability to change. Um, whereas a Teams direct routing, you've got that, it's, it's one client, one size fits all on that front at the moment. Um, it is important to note, and this is where that concurrent call count, there is a fair use policy applies. So for anyone in the room who's thinking, I'm going to purchase 10 Telstra calling for Office 365 licenses and I'm going to give them to everyone in my organisation and everyone will be able to make an outbound call. The fair use policy applies that you can only, from a single user account, you can only make uh, X number of simultaneous telephone calls. So you can't purchase one or two or three and dial 400 people simultaneously across the organisation. Fair use policy applies in there and prevents you from making those, those, those multiple calls out. So certainly some elements to be aware of. From an endpoint space, we've got Eric uh, popping up very shortly to uh, to introduce us uh, what we're talking about from a poly, from a poly perspective uh, to show what's happening inside that marketplace. So definitely watch out and and uh, and and uh, be ready to see what's coming up. Experiences learned, as we talked about before, planning is really balanced by the complexity of your organisation. If you're a single site with 50 people, you don't have a very complex route out to the internet. Um, and you've got very basic telephony services, it goes without saying that the planning and readiness assessment component for your business will be completely different to someone who has a 10-seat organisation with a 1,000 users um, and very complex call routing and planning capabilities. So that's why we have that balanced approach with or customised approach with regards to the readiness and planning exercise. What you put into the planning exercise really drives the outcome and any success that is driven um, through the delivery of the project is largely made up front. Um, Certainly, as I indicated before, the client route to the internet has never been more important for both Telstra calling for Office 365 and Teams direct routing. Identity and access control. Sounds silly, but the way in which you establish that Office 365 tenancy and the identity that you sign onto your computer with ideally should be the same identity that you use up in the cloud. Um, we've had businesses before that have a different identity on the workstation than they do in the cloud. It creates a disjointed experience and something that we'd really try and mitigate against or, or try and align those identities across. So making sure that fundamentally your identity across the environment is rock, locked in and rock solid is absolutely key and crucial moving forward. Uh, but as I think about it, voice is really the thin edge of the wedge. As, uh, as we talked about, getting voice into that cloud-based workload, starting to use the digital voice asset for something more than just a real-time communication, something that is available to be consumed retrospectively. Even if we consider that as purely an accessibility option, where someone's looking at that, that video feed and being able to read it without having to listen to it at, at an audible level. You know, there's some fantastic options that are there to open up the, the field of meetings and communication to a much broader audience moving forward. From Jasco's opinion, uh, you know, complex porting is still complex porting. If you're bringing numbers across from any base service, it still takes four to six weeks I mean, because that's a coordination between carriers. Um, Telstra has spent a lot of time with regard to improving the Greenfields number allocation inside Telstra calling for Office 365. So much so that, that, that you know, we can start to turn new services on with new 100 number blocks um, you know, within, a, within a couple of days. Um, so it's much improved on that. And also Telstra provides some very interesting uh, testing services when you are doing a migration across to TCO 365 and you can test the outbound call route before you make that final cut across. So it gives you the ability to test the availability, test, make sure your users are comfortable before you do the, 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 the switch across. And also you've got a week's grace to then say, hang on, it's not working as I expected if you did want to cut back across to the old platform. So there's definitely some smarts that Telstra have brought into their offering with regards to Telstra calling for Office 365, being able to assist customers on boarding and to provide them with the best possible experience moving forward. Key security recommendations for me, make sure your end user clients are absolutely updated. Skype is obviously governed by the Office, uh, the Office updates uh, component. Um, and depending upon what version you're using, you might be using a semi-annual channel or some other targeted channels. Make sure those updates are happening as regularly as possible so that you get the best possible experience. Um, we've certainly seen some, some scenarios before where businesses have been using the released version of a, of, a, uh, of a client which doesn't provide or doesn't match what the server backends are able to deliver and capable of. Get familiar with a Microsoft Security Score. It's a free tool and assessment that allows you to baseline or benchmark your installation of Office 365 against other people uh, right across the world. Whilst it doesn't provide you with a guarantee that you're going to be protected or secure, what it does is that it alerts you to areas that you might not have configured to best protect or best improve your security posture um, from an overall business standpoint. It points you in the directions of things that, hey, have you looked at this? Have you turned this? We recommend enabling this to provide you with a better level of protection and cover. Um, and certainly modern authentication, um, as opposed to just basic challenge response usernames and passwords, the Active Directory authentication libraries that have been enabled through Office 365 and extending across into the broader stack is absolutely something we recommend turning on so that you can take the benefits of elements such as conditional access and multi-factor authentication 
you saw me demonstrating before when I logged on to those services and took a telephone call to verify who I am. The final point for me from a key security recommendation is get familiar and try and get on board with conditional access. You don't necessarily need to use the Microsoft-based tools, but they provide a service directly out of the box that's integrated with inside the Office 365 stack. The conversation here is, as Courtney Snell, I know my username, my password. I can log in with, it, with that typically. However, as this is a cloud-based service, I can log in anywhere from the world. How do they know that just my username and password is me? So as you saw before, when I'm inside the JASCO office, I'm inside my corporate LAN, my username and password is sufficient because I'm on a domain joined machine. However, if I'm outside the organization and I'm on a domain joined machine, it wants to know my username, my password, but hey, I'm gonna prompt you for a third check to make sure that you are who you say you are. And in my circumstance, you saw that tip my mobile telephone ring before, that allowed me access into the interface. That works right across the, uh, the stack and Teams is no exception to that. So protecting and locking down access to the digital asset with inside Teams, as you can see, it's an amazing window into the organization that allows you to co-author, collaborate and communicate with people. But if you're not providing the best level of protection on the outside, you're exposing that out to the wide world. So certainly something to be, uh, to be aware of moving forward. Thank you very much. How you Thanks, Court. I think you can uh, have a well-deserved drink now, so I'm sure you might duck out and get a water. Yeah, no worries. Um, as Courtney mentioned, um, we've got Eric Barber from Polly, who's going to come up now and uh, have a discussion around some of the great things that Polly are doing in the marketplace. But just before he uh, jumps in, into his presentation, I'd just like to thank Stan from uh, Polly for his generosity in regards to sponsoring today's event. I uh, really appreciate it. Wouldn't have happened without your uh, efforts. So thank you to the guys at Polly. Morning, everybody. I'm Eric Barber. I'm from Poly in Melbourne. Uh, Poly is a merging of two companies. A year ago, uh, the Polycom company was bought by Plantronics, the headset vendor. Uh, and last, early this month, we launched our new brand as Poly. So uh, welcome to, I think this is our second event as, as under the Poly brand. So welcome. Um, I'm going to bring three things here today is really looking at the last mile. So touching on something that that Leon mentioned uh, during his keynote was that um, Microsoft are looking at pushing compute to the edge. Uh, and we are really looking at then the interface between you, the users, and, and the technology stack. So I've only got a few minutes, so I'm only gonna cover a, a few things. Uh, but if you've got any questions about headsets, which I'm not really gonna cover, come and see myself. Uh, Robbie Chia, he's in a poly shirt up the back, or Stan, and we can talk to you about some of the, uh, the last mile stuff between the users and their computer. Um, so I just wanted to talk quickly about our conferencing stuff. So with Teams, Teams coming into the desktop, Teams is also coming into the meeting space. So the huddle space, your conference room. Um, about a month ago, we launched a new product for Poly. Uh, it's called the Poly Studio. It's a all-in-one soundbar device. Uh, it launches as a USB connectivity, so it's USB-C. Uh, but it brings some key Polytech or Polycom technologies. Uh, so it has active speaker tracking and group framing. So what that means is as I'm talking and we're sitting around a table, instead of being a static image on the screen, the camera will actually find the active speaker frame and bring them to the center. No one in the space is talking. It will just frame the group. So everyone still stays engaged with people on the far end. Um, it has a 120 degree field of view and also has some smarts to do fisheye correction. So with these wide angle cameras, we see that the edges of the image can be curved. Uh, the smarts, smart guys at Polycom built some, uh, built some smarts into this device to pull that image up so everyone looks nice and square. Um, is capable of 4K video, uh, has a 12 foot mic pickup. Uh, so it's got a really good microphone pickup range on it. Uh, it also has some of the key Polycom technologies around the noise block acoustic fence for zoning. Um, comes with a multitude of uh, mounting options out of the box. Uh, so it has tabletop mounts and wall mounts built in. Um, but most importantly, even though it's a USB device, we actually have the ability to manage and provision these. What that means is from an IT perspective, rather than being a, a set and forget or leaving and hoping it works, is that uh, out of a cloud-based management platform or our on-premise, if you're a, an existing customer, um, we can provision firmware, we can see settings, we can uh, see the status of the device. 
And we've also got some analytics that come up and play with that. So if you want to have a look, it's actually sitting over here with a HP slice running the full Microsoft Teams room uh, system, which was what we joined into the meeting before. Um, another thing to steal from Leon uh, is, is the mobile first workforce. So what we're seeing uh, out in the market is there's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies are looking at mobile delivery of whether it's applications or uh, interfaces to their software or, or whatnot. So the mobile first workforce is, is becoming very predominant. Uh, last year, the, the Plantronics brand developed this product here called the Alara, uh, and it was developed co-developed with Microsoft. It's a mobile first platform. So this is a Teams first device. Uh, so that means that it has a preference for Teams you look closely, there's a Teams button up there. And if you're paired with your mobile phone on this platform, and you press that Teams button, it will launch your Teams client. So if you use the dial pad and you've got it set for a Teams preference, it will actually dial out through your Teams calling platform. Um, it comes in a, a variety of flavors. So it comes with a wired headset, a wireless headset, even can have a handset. For There are still some people out there that can't slam a headset, but you can certainly slam a telephone. Um, so there are still a few people out there who have a telephone. Um, so it, it, it can be configured to suit what your users are doing. So if your users are all Voyager UC focused headsets throughout your whole organization, you can provision these so that they come with the, the charging and docking station built straight in, dock your headset, pair your mobile phone, and away you go. Um, but to touch on the last mile, um, Polycom are known for their phones. So uh, at Enterprise Connect this year, Poly launched our latest phone. It's the next generation in telephones. They're a replacement for our current VVX range. Um, they are a full Teams supported device. So that means they're a nine, uh, seven inch uh, HD display, uh, 1080p, 30 frames a second calling. Uh, running Android with full team support. So that means you get your Cortana button. Hey, Cortana, start my meeting. Hey, Cortana, what's the weather? Hey, Cortana, what time's lunch? Um, it comes with Wi-Fi. It comes in a smaller form factor for uh, knowledge workers. So it's essentially the same phone. We reduce the size of the screen and we remove the video. Um, but these devices will become flexible. So what this means is, again, it's about the way your users want to work. So do they want a traditional telephone with a traditional headset, handset, or do they want to pair their headset? Do they want to have a device on its own? Do they want to stick it in the corner, just Bluetooth pair their, their headset to it and walk away? Um, so this will support a full range of Plantronics headsets as well. So there's no need to have bespoke headsets. It will work across uh, as you can see, our decked headsets right through to our wired headsets. Um, that's all I really wanted to talk about today is that with your migration into Teams and Telstra calling, uh, the, the, this last mile is very important. This is the one that helps drive user adoption. The more comfortable they are with what's in front of them, the more comfortable they are with the technology that we use. So um, thanks for five minutes. Um, I hope that I didn't go over time, uh, but I'll just hand back and um, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'd like to now call upon um, some of the panel members. We've assembled a panel for a bit of Q&A time for um, all of you to um, yeah, fire some some questions. So if I can just call up uh, Jahan again, Jahan Sheik. So Jahan's the partner technical architect at Microsoft. Um, welcome, Jahan. We've also got Chris Smith, who's the Microsoft specialist within Telstra. And last but not least, uh, Christopher Bradley, who's the IT support manager at AMC Consultants. If you could just make your way up to the chair. Um, now we've got four headsets uh, that Polly have kindly donated to us today for the first four who actually um, ask questions, but I'm really keen on getting one myself. So I'm going to fire off the first question. Um, I am joking, by the way, in regards to getting the, the headset, but I will, will fire off with the first question. Uh, so Christopher at AMC. Um, so AMC consultants are consultants within the mining industry, and they were probably one of the uh, first three organisations to deploy a TCO 365 solution. 
So my question to you, Chris, is what do you, what benefits did you see in your organisation deploying the TCO three six five solution? So for us, it was there was a few obvious choices to go to. We've been using Skype for a while. We've got nine to give you the background. There's nine offices across the world. Uh, four of those are based in Australia. Um, so we've been using Skype online for a while. We had existing PABX systems that had to be replaced. So for us, it was sort of a logical choice from that adoption point we're talking about. Our um, users were already quite comfortable. We just turned on another feature. There was no need to launch the system. Um, the benefits we seen were, from an IT point of view, we've dropped the complexities of PABX. We now have all our users on a standardised platform that are cut over, which is all of our Australian offices. So that was that was a benefit. But the benefits we've seen well, since we've cut over are ones that you can't quantify. So um, there's obvious when you compare costs, we now have calling that's standardised pricing. We don't have to pay for maintenance on old systems. We don't have to, to call Telstra and Samsung and everyone when our PABX fails. But the benefits for the users are the ones that we could never quantify and we've now seen since cutover. One of the big ones has been we have a huge mobile workforce. So the staff that we have, about 50% are off-site at any given time. Quite often they're in really remote locations, countries I didn't know existed and I've had to Google to find out that they were real. Um, in locations that w what we would consider a remote country, they're a remote location within that country. Um, so for the users, it's allowed them better connection. And what we were having prior to going across the CTO, quite commonly we'd have a, a worker in a country I don't know that existed, and they'd call home. And there'd be often with children and partners. We, we were getting calls from 1,500 just to say you might be Now they call back at the local. So it's not that we cared so much about the cost, we don't want our staff being disconnected from home because we sent them to somewhere that they, no one really wanted to be. That doesn't just connect them back to family, that connects them back to the work that is here. So if I'm here, they know that they can reach me. They have much better pressure, better reach to me. Um, to my team, we can now set up, and Jasco has been great in helping us with this, now set up better communication points for people to reach IT one thing to be based in Melbourne, but if you're somewhere in South Africa, time zones don't align, but my team's scattered across the world. Um, so the, the benefits have continued on that uh, our, our foreign offices don't have representative IT and finance and all services, now have a unified We're not paying an international call to an accountant in, in Vancouver to say, how's it going? So the benefits are not just purely cost, and they're really hard to quantify the workforce, um, but everyone is jumping on Vasco and working with that. Our, our, our setup, our communication really The interaction is just something you, can, you can't get from PABX, you can't get from email. Um, as much as we talk about unified communications and advanced collaboration, at the end of the day, nothing beats seeing the face and having a conversation. No email, no text message, no POV system. Um, Courtney, you mentioned for an inbound call, you as an admin can specify whether they use it's received on the Skype client or the Teams client. Can that be done per user or is that organisation wide? Yeah, it can be done uh, per user. Yeah, exactly right. So I get the ability to pick and choose which users. So you can batch users or do them one at yeah. a time to, to articulate that change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for quality and uh, the video quality, uh, where's that been controlled or how easy is it to control Quaz on it? Yeah, sure. So Quaz, I suppose, uh, is fundamental making sure that your network is honouring it um, to start with and configured um, to support both Teams and a, or a Skype business environment um, because both of the clients will be able to tag um, the, the packets and the payloads appropriately. Um, at both the PC, the network, the switching layer, um, obviously needs to be able to honour those, uh, those uh, QoS codes all the way through. Um, but then it comes to what's the connectivity like out across the internet. 
or in some circumstances, businesses may have a compliance or a, um, a requirement in order to use a, a direct connect, private connection across into the Office 365 service. Both of those are options also that allows you to, I suppose, continue to tag that packet right through a private connection if you are using a direct connect interviewer. Um, it's important to note though that these services that have been delivered from Microsoft have been delivered as internet facing services. They're built fundamentally to be accessible out across the entire world. So it makes sense that from a consumer or business perspective that you have the best possible internet service and that you are getting out to the internet as an end user as quickly as possible. One of the architectures that Microsoft try and recommend is that rather than centralizing um, the user's internet come through one particular location, break out to the internet as quick as possible. As quick as the end user can get to the internet, they can get to the Microsoft data center in that location. Once you hit the Microsoft data centers in, the, in a worldwide location, you are routed at the best possible speed through the Microsoft internal network. So the closeness, the, the proximity to the internet is fundamental to, to making the best possible experience and outcome. Um, and that has actually been a, a bit of a planning challenge for some organizations that really like to, um, not strangle, but like to control the internet to a point where that everything is brought to the location. Um, it is an interesting conversation and one which we've, we've had many times with regards to how do we treat, how do we trust Microsoft um, as, a, uh, as, as, as a trusted partner? Um, how do we communicate with them at a network level um, to try and improve those services? Certainly fundamentally that route out to the internet needs to be as quick and as close as possible to, to the input. And, and just to give you a, a bit of a different perspective as well, quality of service, obviously very important. And thank you for hitting on that quite extensively. Um, Teams uh, itself is quite optimized for video and voice. It's a cloud-born application. Um, and what we've generally found from experience, uh, and you saw the video quality today, uh, is phenomenal. Uh, what we're generally finding now is that it is, and of, of course it is created for that mobile first uh, workforce as well. Within Microsoft, and, and you know, I'm on meetings uh, quite a bit uh, with our partners, customers, and Microsoft folks. And generally, if they're using Teams, uh, they're, they're quite open to now turning their video on just because the experience is so good. Um, whereas in the Skype for Business world, uh, although the, the experience was great, but you know, not many people use video. So slightly different um, aspect to that as well. It's, it's, it's quite optimized for a great video and, and voice experience. Still got a question down here at the front. Uh, generally, with Skype, um, the transition to Teams, is there a time frame for when Skype is going to be going away or is it for the near future you still consider both? Might let you feel that one, mate. <laughs> okay, so um, let's first kind of separate Skype for Business uh, from Skype for Business Online. So we've got, you know, Courtney touched on some of the server stuff as well, which was, you know, you've got a lot of servers you're setting up um, and you've got a server deployment. We've also got Skype for Business Online, uh, which lives in Office 365. So when we're talking about that transition at the moment, we're talking about the Skype for Business Online transition to Teams because there's still a requirement for Skype for Business Server. And as a lot of you guys know, we did just release Skype for Business Server 2019. So there is still some development happening in that, and we have no indication of when that's going to switch over to Microsoft Teams. However, that will happen. Now, if we look at it from a perspective of Skype for Business Online, transitioning to Skype uh, to Microsoft Teams, uh, in October of 2018, we actually announced that anyone that's setting up a new tenant with 500 users or less will not have the option of provisioning Skype for Business Online they'll only be able to provision Microsoft Teams for their organization. Now, if there is a requirement for it, there are exceptions that you can you know, submit for. However, that's a great indication just to show you that you know, that transition is happening quite fast. Whereas we, we don't have dates, uh, they haven't you know, shared anything publicly or even internally, so we don't know when that's gonna happen, but there is indications that are happening now uh, publicly that are showing that transition is happening quite fast. Oh. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So if, I mean, if there were, you know, two engineers working on Skype for Business Online, 
10 that are working on teams or even more. So a lot of the development um, is happening on teams, Skype for Business Online, there's very, very little development of new features and functionality. And you'll see, you'll also notice that, you know, a great feature that Courtney pointed out today with back, background blur, we didn't even have on Skype for Business Online. So there's a lot of features that, you know, Teams has already exceeded Skype for Business and Skype for Business Online. Um, another one that, you know, is great on your mobile, you're able to share your mobile screen. We were never able to do that with Skype for Business Online. Hi, probably more a question for yourself, Courtney. Um, we have a very significant contact center presence. I'm really interested in knowing more around Teams in particular and the contact center integration. We use Genesis, so mm -hmm. that's the example. Particularly um, presence across yep. the two systems, busy on busy, so agents don't get calls from teams in particular when they're on a call. Um, and uh, audio conferencing, we do a lot of whole of company conferencing around the whole of the country. One of the, we've effectively had to separate people into agents, non-agents, that's not something we want to take forward. So a view of the strategy on that. In the in the Genesis space, that's right. I should be mic'd up, so I'll put a hold on. Yeah, in the in the uh, in the Genesis uh, Pure Cloud space, are you, are you Genesis or Genesis Pure Cloud? Uh, Pure Cloud. All right. Um, in that, there are two options. There is the Pure Cloud Pure Cloud option, or there's the Edge uh, option that happens as well. Are you guys running uh, Edge the Edge as well? All right. So, in essence, the you know, it, it obviously comes down to both licensing as well, because there is a licensing element on the Genesis Pure Cloud option in order to light up and to enable uh, both the Teams or the Skype-based integration. Uh, the integration works through with inside the Pure Cloud uh, interface, and that you can instant message and you get presence through. But by and large, the calling queue or the calling leg is adjunct, uh, is taken off uh, away from Teams and Skype for Business. So the call will, I suppose, that the, the contacts and the queues and the agents will all come through the Pure Cloud pat platform. And they will then be routed out to the Skype for Business or the Teams endpoint, um, either as a continuous call that you then accept the call through the website when it comes through and the call gets routed, or it's a new call that comes in on that scenario. Um, the busy on busy one, I suppose, is interesting. If you're opening up that constant tie line to the endpoint, um, I, I actually haven't done enough in that space to know what the answer to that particular question is. Um, and it's would certainly you know, ask you further digging on space. Um, I, I haven't done a great deal of integration um, with crypto because I know that it is new to the new to the space, but it's something that I'm relatively well versed in and can find that it's really cool. Unless there's anyone else on the panel that knows uh, what the fuel cloud integration aspects are of busy on busy with Skype for Business Online and Microsoft Teams. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else in the group? Yep, just up the back. Have a run. between non-business Skype and Teams, because right now we have a lot of contractors and if we're doing interviews, et cetera, um, we've got users that have to use Skype personal to, to make those to make those calls. That's a great question. I don't have the answer. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> No, I, I know that that's just uh, so um, that's a great question, actually. Um, and absolutely that integration. And I'm assuming the integration, you're just talking about federation between um, Skype consumer and Skype uh, and sorry, Mike. To make a call. Yeah. Was, did, did you have something to say on that, Leon? Yeah, but that's great feedback because um, that's something that we don't get a lot of. However, I can see use cases for it because we did have um, the federation for messaging for IM between Skype consumer and Skype for business. So that's great feedback.
Hi, uh, my question uh, would be probably more towards Microsoft um, in this case. What is Microsoft's strategy working towards um, uh, bringing this um, calling from cloud uh, from international markets perspective? Because from the business I come from, we have tenancy outside Australia. So we've got uh, our tenancy in Australia, within Australia, but for inter international space as well. So the, one of the challenges that we regularly feel is how do we integrate these multiple tenancies and uh, probably utilize some of these new features that Microsoft is uh, bringing out, working with Telstra, of course, here in an Australian market, but what's happening in the international market space? Okay, so um, I guess two-part question. Um, one is if the tenant is based out of Australia, then your customers or whomever you're working with, if they've got offices in different parts of the world, they are able to purchase calling plans where there's Microsoft calling plans that are available. So US, UK, France, Belgium, or a few to name the few, um, there's a lot more. Now, I was gonna say, there's banking as well. There's that prime, there's always that primary tenancy. No, I don't, don't know why. There's always that primary tenancy. So we have a, a lot of um, companies, I guess, originally set it up as what, 1603 Washington, you know, the White House was a lot of people's anchor tenancy. So they live in the USA. So um, one of the restrictions is that we don't have the rights. And I guess that's what you're about to lead to. But I just want to clarify that there is an anchor tenancy, despite having, I guess, locations that could be global offices that are global. Yeah. Carry on. I think we're getting to the no, licensing aspect. Yes. And then. Um, yeah, okay, I'll keep going. So, so, um, so, so, so from a Microsoft perspective globally, you can buy their PSTM calling from anywhere where they sell it. Um, I, I was saying to the product manager who's sitting there, I won't point him out, but I, I think we have announced some of the international locations. So let's just say a broad, the, the, the majority of Europe, uh, USA, um, places where we have the rights to sell uh, CSP licensing in those regions, then we will open that up and it is a licensing restriction. So um, we won't be providing uh, plus, you know, we will only be providing plus 61 numbers to Australian offices, but if you have a branch in Australia and you need local um, breakouts, then that's what we'll be able to offer for international tenancies. So that's, um, I think we're going into early adoption uh, in the next couple of months, but we're sort of finalising the list and we're hoping to grow upon it. And that's part of through global, uh, Telstra Global that we can sell licensing in those regions. And, and I, so the, the point there is, is coming soon. Um, I think that was the, the that was what I was going to get to as well. Um, however, if it's you know if there's an urgent need for it, absolutely. Um, what Courtney um, alluded to earlier, there's uh, no reason for you not to explore both options. So you can use Telstra calling and direct routing um, wherever is applicable as well. So that's also an option. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll throw. Um, so just a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you use Teams today? That's, that's quite a lot. Impressive. And who, who saw Teams for the first time today? A few people here as well. Okay. And, and, that, and that's all I have. Any other questions? <laughs> 